All right. Oh, you're already recording, so I'm not gonna record. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so we maybe wait for one, two minutes because we started a bit late. Um, but while we are waiting, I just wanted to welcome everyone uh, from various part of the world uh, to our webinar today. And yeah, this is a wonderful opportunity to know people and learn about today about postdoc, <laughs> all about postdoc, <laughs> from finding to sustaining to getting out of it uh, successfully. So um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, just a second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. There's, yeah, there's something loading, but yeah, it looks all set. Okay. Mm. Okay. Awesome. All right. Let's... Yeah. <clears throat> so you may get a bit background noise because my baby will be here in the back so um yeah talking from home so first of all uh yeah let's get started um with the time you know we have so good morning good evening or wherever you are i know we have people from around 40 countries um uh, registered so um this is a wonderful webinar which Dr. Talian and Seth is from um, MKSCC will be presenting to us. And um, the whole uh, topics revolves around understanding postdoc to, you know, finding a postdoc to sustaining or, you know, working as a successful postdoc and then coming out of it as a, you know, in academia or industrial successful career. So uh, we had uh, a lot of questions from you. Uh, I have already sent it to Dr. Taliana uh, in advance and she has looked at it. Uh, still, if you have questions, feel free to ask during the session or using the chat. I will be monitoring the chat um, and and we'll, we'll try to take as much as question as possible. So with that, uh, the agenda is something uh, like I'll, I'll introduce you uh, to iSTEM care some of you or many of you maybe know uh, new to uh, to iSTEM care and and uh, this program and then it will take another maybe four or five minutes and then uh, Dr. Taliana will take over and, and present the webinar so and if you have any questions as I said use the chat uh, to to ask everything so as you know basic basic <laughs> Formality that mute your microphone. Uh, you can use your webcam, but not required um, during the session. Um, but if you have a questions, um, use the chat to ask. Engage, you know, using reactions. If you have a question or anything, come in. Um, share your thoughts, as I said, and we'll be sending you a uh, follow-up email with feedback surveys and any resources which Dr. Taliana will have for you. And yeah uh, so with that iSTEM care uh, is basically um, an international STEM care organization um, the origin is around 2020 when I was doing my postdoc at uh, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis Missouri and having seen the struggle of of researchers not just postdoc but I went through PhD and then into industry then coming back to postdoc uh, I knew that there is a lot of struggle and the resource and knowledge is limited to uh, especially geographies. A lot of geographies in the world are not covered. Uh, so that was an idea with a group of friends. We started this uh, our small organization virtually. Uh, 
is still virtual um, and we have been doing a lot of um, session webinars workshops to educate and empower uh, researchers in, in various ways uh, and that's the mission statement for ISM care uh, the overall approach is, is pretty much collaborative because uh, this organization is purely volunteer based a lot of us are working across the globe in in our career itself like we are doing phds postdoc and um and recently i transitioned to and many people from the volunteering they they got into jobs so basically the idea is to 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 be approached where you learn and at the same time you help others so that's the whole uh, system uh, and we have a lot of initiatives in terms of different work we do um besides these webinar series and workshop and panel discussions we had recently and last year we have been doing uh, interviewing or doing podcast with stem professionals who undertook a totally different career path uh, from their as compared to their education so basically understanding different career trajectory in stem um, after phd or postdoc um, we have STEM learning, a uh, lot of activity there where we conduct a lot of um, career development or, uh, you know, survival related in, in survival in academia related webinar where you kind of learn different skill set, build a skill set about networking, um, career exploration, you know, a lot of things related to career development. So, um, and there are a few, few more which is not listed here. And we also this this year we started um, industry career transition training program called ICTT. Uh, when I transitioned to industry, um, I knew that it's not easy as an international fellows in postdoc to to switch, navigate a lot of you know immigration and and planning about getting into job. So that's where I started this program. This is very focused program for around thirty people. Not we we have very limited people there uh, an idea is to to train and 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 empower people so that they can make their own industry transition in their career uh, it runs for three months every two weeks we have classes um, this is kind of what we talk as I said a lot of career development soft skill and, and transition industry transition navigation uh, topics um, this is uh, kind of sorry uh, purely kind of free we we kind of don't I don't charge for anything but I ask people to donate a hundred dollar to the nonprofit so that they are serious while the session is going on so and they are attentive so that's the idea um, next session we are closing I think and by next month we'll close this first first cohort and start after a month break another one so with that I'll end here if you want to learn more about it, you go. You can visit uh, ISTEM Care website. I'll share things, you know, links into the chat. So, with that, I'll end here and stop my screen sharing, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Thaliana. Welcome, Dr. Thaliana, for today's webinar. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Pawan, for that introduction. And I'm so happy to uh, see so many people joining us today. Welcome to everybody from all over the world. Uh, and I will start sharing my screen so I can now begin the presentation. Wonderful. Yes, so welcome to everybody. I'm Thaliana Stathis, and thank you again to Pawan for inviting me and uh, representing iSTEM Care and inviting me to present today on this topic of succeeding in your future postdoc, how to find a postdoc, how to enjoy it, um, and how to plan your career going forward. All right, so I manage the Office of Career and Professional Development for PhD students and postdocs at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which is a cancer hospital and also a research institute based in New York City. I have provided here my uh, email and also my LinkedIn. I love to connect with people on LinkedIn. So if you are also on LinkedIn, please feel free to add me as well. That way we can stay in touch. And also a disclaimer that uh, I'm representing Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center because that is the institution where I work at. But what I'm presenting here are my own thoughts and opinions on this topic of succeeding in your future postdoc. 
All right, so again, welcome to everybody and thank you to Pawan for inviting me. And if you're just joining us, you can see that the chat is open. Um, so Pawan and I will be looking at the chat to see the questions that you all are putting through. And we will try to look, take a look at all the questions throughout the presentation, presentation, not just at the end. Uh, whenever you have a question, type it in and we'll try and address it throughout the presentation going forward. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm Thaliana Stathis. I direct career and professional development at an institution called Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And I specifically direct this office and work in two different realms uh, in, in terms of supporting students, PhD students and postdocs at our research institution. I help them train to be the best scientists that they can be. That's kind of the realm of professional development. During their time here as a student or a postdoc, I make sure that they are getting all of the necessary training that they need in order to be a great scientist and, a, and have a successful career as a PhD student or a postdoc. And then I also help them think about the next step. That's the aspect of career development in terms of what do you want to do after this training period is over. Being a PhD student or a postdoc is a training period that's supposed to help you figure out what you're going to do next and help you be successful in whatever you're going to do next. And so throughout my time working with students and postdocs, I have kind of noticed um, over the years that there are certain themes in terms of how people are maybe struggling to figure out how to be successful. And so I wanted to share all of those themes with all of you uh, in terms of the advice that I have been giving to students and postdocs. And it's also advice I would like to give to all of you in terms of how to figure out how to be successful in your current career and also moving forward thinking about that next career in research or wherever it may be as well. And so I want to um, kind of share those universal themes in terms of the advice that I have given to maybe students and postdocs like yourself. And also I have worked with a lot of faculty here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, the research institution. I have asked them for their advice about what they are looking for in a candidate. And so I'd like to share all of that information with you as well. And so that's kind of the perspective I have on why I'm giving this talk today, because I have um, seen some of these universal themes and how people can be successful in their research career. And I have talked to faculty in terms of what they're looking for in a candidate. And so all of you might appreciate hearing that information as well. And I um, did see already that somebody had asked a question in the chat about some insight on restarting a research career after you have taken a break. So just type in those questions. That question I will be answering later on in one of my slides later on when I talk about the cover letter. So thank you for submitting that question already. Okay, so another aspect about why I would like to present to all of you today is not only in my current job at Memorial Sloan Kettering, do I have I kind of gained this um, expert advice I would like to share with all of you, but also from my own personal experience of being a PhD student. I actually didn't do a postdoc, but I was a PhD student for a number of years. Um, and then I myself thought about what I would like to do after the PhD and would I like to stay in academia or pursue some other options as well. So from my own experiences of navigating those different situations about transitioning from academia to maybe another career and thinking about whether or not to do a postdoc, I would like to share from my own experiences some advice with all of you on that topic. And in case you were curious, I have also worked as a journal editor and I have also worked at another institution called Columbia University, also based in New York City, before coming to Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, in case you were curious about other institutions in New York City as well. All right, so with that, I would like to introduce the topics that I'm going to be covering in today's talk. And remember to utilize the chat and Pawan and I will be taking a look at it throughout the session to see what questions you have on these topics. So as Pawan was introducing me, he mentioned we're gonna be talking about three main things like why to do a postdoc in the beginning, and then actually how to apply for one and how to get the job. And then finally, how to enjoy the postdoc and be successful in the postdoc and be thinking about what you'd like to do afterwards. Because again, it's a training period that's always going to lead you to getting the preparation that you need to being successful in the career that you want to do after your postdoc is done. So we're gonna be covering those three areas 
of thinking about why doing one, applying for one, and then actually being happy in the postdoc and succeeding in the postdoc. Uh, and preparing for that next step. So uh, Pawan had shared with me the information about everybody in the audience today, and it seemed like most people were either finishing up their PhD or currently doing a postdoc, or maybe taking some time off and they want to go back to doing a postdoc. So either you are looking to do your first postdoc or maybe your second postdoc or maybe your second postdoc after having some taken some time off previously. So all of this information will be applicable to all of you. And if you also are thinking about, you already know that you want to stay in academia and you're thinking about how you could become a future um, junior faculty member and how you could be successful in that regard, also be thinking about from this other perspective, uh, for example, when you are a post, when you're interviewing for a postdoc position, how you want to make sure you have a good interview experience and you're choosing the right lab. And then also be thinking about it from the perspective, well, one day I'm gonna be a future faculty member. I will have to interview candidates myself. I will have to be a mentor to other people myself. How do I want to, um, develop some interview methods so that I can really get a sense of who's going to be a good candidate for my lab and what kind of mentoring practices do I think I would like to have in my lab going forward in order to mentor the future people in my lab. So you should be thinking about all of those questions already and they're going to help you when you're applying for a postdoc position because you're going to be thinking about what type of interview experience is really going to help me figure out which lab is going to be a good fit for me. This is going to be a good home for me. And what type of mentoring is going to work best for me as well? You really need to think about the mentor um, in whose lab you'll be joining and if what type of style they have and if that's going to be a good match for you. So really, all of those questions are important when applying for a postdoc position and moving forward. You're a future faculty member as well. And you're kind of approaching things from the other side of being a faculty member. And so um, I hope there will be some time. I had told Pawan that there are some questions that I would like to ask him just to for him to also share his experience with all of you um, about doing a postdoc and then thinking about jobs after. Um, so Pawan, I'll kind of give you a heads up when I have a question for you, but I'm just summarizing here the questions that I um, am hoping we'll have time to discuss together about why Pawan was interested in doing a postdoc, how he searched for opportunities, um, the interviewing experience, and basically how he made sure it was a good postdoc experience for himself, um, and, and then how he thought about what jobs he wanted to pursue afterwards. So that's a preview of the questions that I'll be asking Pawan. And I'll have another slide that says Q&A, Q questions and answers, um, when we will be having that, that discussion uh, maybe three or four times throughout the, the presentation. All right, and so we are recording the talk. Um, and also after today's session, I'm gonna be sending you a copy of these slides. Um, so not to worry, there's a lot of information. I, sometimes there's a lot of text on the slides. Sometimes I, I know I tend to talk a bit quickly, but I want to give you all as much information as possible today, um, but not to worry, you will be getting a copy of the slides. And I'm also gonna be sharing with you um, another document with some more information about the institution where I work, Memorial Sloan Kettering and how you and I can stay in touch afterwards. All right, so I had listed that series of topics about what I would like to talk about today. And we're gonna go right ahead and start with topic number one, which is why and how to consider doing a postdoc in the first place. As part of your overall career goals, why would you consider doing a postdoc and how to consider doing one? So I'd like to provide you all with the definition from the National Postdoc Association here in the United States about, from their perspective, what is a postdoc? And so this is basically for any postdoc in the US, um, how should they kind of define themselves? So a postdoc is an individual holding a doctoral level degree. They're engaged in this temporary period of mentored research and training for the purpose of acquiring the skills that they need to then go ahead and pursue the career path of his or her own choosing after this training period is done. All right, so that's kind of a general definition, but let's break it down a bit more here. So what I want you to take away from that is that the postdoc is this training period to then help you get into your, the future career path that you would really love to pursue. Um, yes, typically it is a training period to pursue a faculty career, but as you saw on this previous slide, it's, we have it more general. It's a training period to pursue a career path of your own choosing. So typically it is for preparing to be a faculty, but there are also other um, careers that it could provide you with good training for as well. 
So just I, when looking through the questions that you all had submitted prior to this webinar today, there were a lot of really interesting questions and I'm going to try and answer them on these slides as best as I can. But definitely a common theme that I noticed in the questions that you all had submitted was that, you know, when thinking about a postdoc, does it really only prepare me for a faculty career? And my answer to that is yes, traditionally that has been the one um, career that the postdoc will prepare you for. But I also want you to keep in mind that just because you're in a postdoc and you decide not to pursue academia, that doesn't mean that it, this is a completely dead end road. You can utilize that experience to make you more marketable for other careers as well. This is important experience that you have in research, even if you're not gonna stay in academia, and you can utilize this extra research experience to show why you are a strong candidate for other careers as well. One example being that you could have a higher level job with an industry, a higher level scientist position with an industry because you already have a lot of research experience. Um, it happens to be in academia, but you basically have a lot of research experience also having done a postdoc. So you can start off at a higher level in industry. So that's one way that the, that the postdoc can help you prepare for a different career outside of academia. And also just to note that I am well aware that during your PhD, you may not really uh, understand all of the different career options that are available to you. And I've worked with many postdocs who initially they did the postdoc because they weren't really aware of other things that they could do. And besides doing a postdoc, so this was the natural way for them to move from the PhD into the next step. They weren't really aware of other options. So I totally understand that a lot of people start the postdoc for that reason, because it just seems like the natural step, they're not aware of other options out there. So in that way, you can utilize the postdoc to then learn about other careers available to you. And so that's how the postdoc training experience can still be a good experience for you because you're taking that time to do the research, also learn about other careers within academia or outside of academia, and then move into those careers afterwards. And there was another question from the submitted questions about how difficult is it to get a faculty job in the US? Well, this, you know, very kind of general question here that I have to provide a general answer with. But yes, it's difficult, but certainly not impossible. I have worked with so many postdocs here at Memorial Sloan Kettering who came to us from all around the world, did their postdoc with us, and then they landed faculty jobs. Uh, in the US or maybe sometimes uh, in another country, but many have landed a job in the US. So it's challenging, but absolutely not impossible. Just to keep in mind for those who are um, thinking about, uh, okay, I see a note here that there is a loss of audio. I hope uh, everybody can still hear me. If somebody can just type in the chat that they can hear me uh, so I can keep going forward. Okay, yes, yeah, okay, great. So I'm sorry if somebody can't hear me, but everybody is mentioning that they can hear me. So I'm going to continue. All right, thank you. Um, so just to note, for those of you who are thinking about a faculty career, there are some key components here. If you want a faculty job in the US, you should have lots of research experience already in the US. So that's a good reason for doing a postdoc in the US first to get that experience. And absolutely, you need to have a strong CV with publications. But the other aspect of that is it's not just the CV, it's also the mentor who can help you network um, with hiring committees at institutions that you might like to apply to. All right, so these are all things to keep in mind. If you wanna pursue a faculty career, you're gonna be working on developing your CV, adding more publications over time, but also choosing a mentor who has a network and they know people at other institutions and people who are on hiring committees. And when it gets to time for applying for jobs, they can also help you in that regard as well. And then one last thing I have to say is always have a plan B. Again, the postdoc is this training period to think about the next step for you, but you always need to have a plan B for whatever that next step is going to be. You can try for faculty jobs, try and apply for them. If it doesn't work out, you always have a second option as well that you can fall back on. All right, so I saw also there was a question um, in the chat about if, if it's difficult for somebody who did their PhD in another country to get a scientist position in the US after doing a postdoc. So my advice to you there is if you did your PhD in another country, I know most people on the call are in that situation, then it would be helpful if you ultimately want to get a scientist job in industry in the United States, it would be helpful 
to first, you know, have a, a job here in the United States, probably in academia, since you're coming from academia, and then after that, apply for an industry job in the US after. I think it would be difficult to be applying for an industry job uh, without ever having worked in the United States before. So try and get some of that experience working in the United States and then apply for industry jobs afterwards. Okay, so I think that addresses the question there. And I'm going to continue with the next slide, which is that um, when you're thinking about the postdoc position that you would like to apply for, think about what you basically have accomplished so far in your PhD. And then this is the field that you have already gained expertise in. So now what's the purpose of the postdoc? This is your next step where you want to gain new expertise. You want to work in a new field. Uh, you have kind of become this expert. Your PhD thesis represents the, ex the experts that you have become in this one area. But now it's time to move on and explore another area. So that's the goal of the postdocs. You want to be thinking from a research perspective, what are some new things that you'd like to learn and become an expert in? And then ultimately, it's besides the research, the postdoc is an opportunity to gain some of these other skills in terms of kind of leading people leading a group of people and leading projects. As a PhD student, you know, you're kind of a bit lower on the totem pole, as is to say, where you may not have had a lot of experience to lead other people. But as a postdoc, you are more senior in the lab. So you should be having more of those opportunities and getting developing more of those skills. So those are some reasons why the postdoc could be an important experience for you to learn more about a new research field and also to gain more leadership skills as well in the lab that you may not have had previously during your PhD. So I'd like to break it down a bit more into three other areas, which I have underlined here on this slide. So what new fields would you like to explore? Ultimately, what would you like to study as a faculty member? Um, this new field that you're studying in your postdoc, maybe that's the field that you want to stay in as faculty. Or a lot of times people decide to do interdisciplinary research with their PhD research and their postdoc research combined. Maybe that's something that you would like to do as well. So think about the new field or new fields you would like to explore. And it could be, you know, kind of a similar area to what you're in now with new techniques or just a completely different research area utilizing the same techniques that you're already familiar with? Do you want to um, do basic biomedical research, translational or clinical research? Now, I, I saw in the survey that all of you had taken before attending this webinar today that not all of you are coming from the biomedical sciences. So I, I understand that, um, but because my perspective is for doing biomedical research and working with students and postdocs doing biomedical research, that's the type of advice that I can provide. But I think some of the more general advice is still applicable to everybody in any research field, even if you're not coming from biomedical research. Um, but essentially think about if you have previously been doing more basic research, would you like to do more translational research after? And maybe that's the purpose of the postdoc. Um, so that's kind of from the research perspective. Now, what new skills would you like to learn? What things have you really not been able to do in your PhD or in your first postdoc, um, and then you would like to uh, basically gain more of these skills in your postdoc or in your second postdoc? You'd like to have that opportunity um, to basically be a leader of projects and a leader of people, maybe more opportunities to teach and mentor other people, develop collaborations with other labs as well and kind of show how you can work independently but also in a team-based environment it's very important to de be developing these leadership and collaborative and mentoring skills you may not have had a lot of opportunities to do that during the phd because you were very focused on your work but now as a postdoc yes you're still focused on your work you're exploring research but this is the point of the postdoc is also to be to be developing these other skills as well so you definitely want to have that as a goal for yourself and then ultimately if you didn't publish a lot during your PhD, the postdoc is an opportunity to be publishing more and to be maybe applying for grants or fellowships and to be giving more presentations. All of the, you know, these three things that are kind of the bread and butter of academia, publishing, presenting your work at conferences, being invited to give a talk or uh, applying to give a talk at a conference and writing grants, this bread and butter in academia, try and do as much as you can your PhD or in your first postdoc and then continue to do more in your second postdoc as well. Okay. And then the last thing is you want to try a different lab culture from the lab that you worked in for your PhD. 
So maybe you worked in a lab with a more junior faculty member. Maybe it was a big lab or a small lab. Maybe you worked with a more senior faculty member. So think about that type of uh, working environment experience and lab culture that you had in your PhD or in your first postdoc, and then try something new for the, for the postdoc or for the second postdoc. You wanna try out these different working environments to see what mentoring uh, style and what lab culture works best for you. All right, so um, I see that we have some questions in the chat that Pawan is answering. So thank you so much, Pawan, for, uh, for taking uh, an eye on the questions in the chat. And also I had now a question for Pawan, if he doesn't mind answering, if he could just share with the audience, uh, why was he interested in doing a postdoc uh, after the PhD? And okay, actually, I don't know, Pawan, I'm not able to hear you. Okay, can now you hear I can. Me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I was saying that I was the one person who was not interested in postdoc after my PhD. I was like, I don't want to do. So, but <laughs> so I went into industry career. Uh, I worked for two years in India, in industry. Um, but there is like a couple of reasons came in while, you know, thinking about doing postdoc, which was about two years. Right. Um, I think the first thing was that as an international candidate, um, we don't have international experience working in cultures of you know, different people. Uh, so that was one reason I really wanted to explore and see the, the postdoc culture in, in, in the foreign setting. And uh, second thing was um, I learned that even, you know, if you are in not maybe it's not very common in us uh, people go after phd into industry immediately it's very common in us but in international setting um, the industrial you know job market there requires you to have uh, this international experience of postdoc where so that you can grow in your you know industry career or anywhere you are working so you basically get a tag and get a, a international affiliation on your cv right uh, third point was, um, if you if you, I wanted to transition in, in 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 U.S. industry, I needed to have academic affiliation to get a lot of legal visa related profile made and network with people. So I think postdoc provides a lot of opportunity for networking, meeting people, learning about different career as you said. So I think that was the reason. But I was very clear what I want to do after my postdoc. I was really not so so that I kept my focus there um, exactly where where I want to go after my postdoc so is that answers yes absolutely thank you so much for sharing um yeah I think the, the other questions I'll ask you later on but that was very helpful and uh yeah just looking at the messages in the chat I think it's a great idea if somebody for example has done a PhD in molecular biology with a little computational biology experience and then for their postdoc they want to be purely computational biology I think that's a wonderful scenario for you to be in I don't think the PI whose lab you're applying to they would have any questions about that that's a very typical scenario where you want to do a postdoc in this new field you've got a taste of it in your PhD, but now you really want to focus on it a lot more in your postdoc and gain that expertise. Um, and so ultimately, the, the question is about if you did a postdoc in pure computational biology, uh, and then if you were applying for faculty jobs, what, which research experience would count more, the PhD or the postdoc? Uh, well, really both count um, but it's also about what you are proposing to do as a faculty member. Ultimately, as a faculty member, do you want to just be a pure computational biologist because that's what you liked doing in your postdoc? If so, then that's the research statement that you're gonna write. And those are the departments that you're gonna apply to. And then they're really gonna focus on your postdoc work uh, because that was all computational biology when they're evaluating you as a candidate. But if you decide that if as a faculty member, you want to do more interdisciplinary research and bring back some of your molecular biology expertise from your PhD, then they're going to also look at your PhD publications and your PhD research closely as well, because you're proposing to integrate that into your lab as a faculty member. So it really depends on what you're proposing to do and the departments that you're applying to at those institutions. And so whether or not they'll focus more on the postdoc work or the PhD and the postdoc work depends on what you're proposing to do. 
All right, and then there was another question about how you do select a good PI. Um, so I will talk about that, some things to look out for, but absolutely you want to get a sense of their mentoring style um, and if that's a right fit for you. Because everybody has a different style and you just have to figure out what style works for me. Do I like to meet with somebody every day? Do I want to meet with somebody once a week? Uh, what type of support do I want from my mentor? Do I want to be more independent? Um, so you need to get a sense of that when you're interviewing with the person. And okay, another question about um, postdoc positions available on any particular website. You would really need to look at the university's website um, if they have a section on postdoc opportunities. And then also sometimes the lab, the individual lab that you wanna to apply to, they have a careers page that lists post postdoc opportunities as well. I'll give some examples of those in a second. Okay, and so, Another question here about for an industry job, is it necessary to do an international postdoc um, if for if an industry job in India? So maybe I'll let Pawan answer that in the chat. Um, okay, yeah, so thank you again, Pawan, for taking keeping an eye on the chat and I'm gonna continue here. And I'm just gonna mention that when I have given this talk before um, and I had done the similar question answer session like I had did with Pawan um, with other people who had done a postdoc and were now thinking about careers that they wanted to explore afterwards. And I had asked those people the same question, but why were they interested um, in doing a postdoc in general? Uh, so basically they gave some similar answers. They really wanted to just explore doing a, uh, working in a different research field, try out a different mentor and a different work culture and see how they liked that. They wanted to move and live in a new place and you know do the postdoc in a different place and then use the time of the postdoc uh, to basically figure out if they, whether or not they want to stay in academia. Use that postdoc experience to then make those decisions. Okay, so, now, moving on to the next topic, which is about some themes that I have noticed in terms of the people that I have worked with here at Sloan Kettering about how were they able to be a successful postdoc. Uh, one thing that I noticed is that they are very, they always had a very collaborative spirit and they were always open to this concept of networking, which is really not such a scary term. It's all about just forming relationships with other researchers, with other colleagues. And they were very open to working in different environments and working with different teams and learning new things from these different teams. And then over time, you develop this network of people who can be your mentors and provide you support and guidance along the way throughout your career and maybe suggest more people to be mentors for you as well. So you're always open to developing new relationships. Um, and so, yeah, from also from what Pawan had said, he was interested in coming to the US and having a different experience, a different work experience in that regard. Um, so I think successful people are always open to this new concept of challenging themselves in a different way and putting themselves in a different research environment and being open to working with different people and learning uh, about learning things from different people in different contexts. Uh, and so on this regard, this is why I think that oftentimes people do use the postdoc as a way to work in a different environment, oftentimes to move to a different country and, and do a postdoc in a different country from where they did their PhD. Um, because ultimately throughout your career, you want to give yourself all of these new experiences as possible. And so what I have noticed is that oftentimes postdocs are coming from different countries because they want to have that important research experience in a different country from where they did their PhD. And not only that, just for your career, but also the research benefits from that as well. Research always benefits from um, international collaborative work in large networks instead of people working in silos in their own labs and not collaborating. Research is always better when it's more collaborative. Um, so having said that, this is why, again, um, Memorial Sloan County, where I work, has many international postdocs because we have found that people like to use the postdoc as this opportunity to work in a different environment. Uh, but I just wanted to note to all of you that the postdoc is not the only way to get this type of experience. Sometimes people do a research exchange or an internship. Uh, maybe they'll do a postdoc later on, uh, but sometimes they start with a short research exchange between institutions. And then if you're a more senior scientist, sometimes people are a visiting investigator. Um, or if you're a more junior scientist, sometimes people might work as a research technician or lab manager. And then later on, they will 
apply for a PhD and then become a postdoc after that. So there are different roles that you could have within an institution besides being a postdoc. You know, obviously if you have a PhD, then usually the postdoc is the, the typical next step after that. But sometimes people are a visiting investigator for a period of time. Sometimes people just do a short research exchange or internship. Uh, and then they think about the more long-term career options that they would like to pursue as well. Okay, so your postdoc strategy. When is the right time for you to change environments for your postdoc? And again, it's this is all about your personal situation. Sometimes people do a first postdoc in their home country, and then they think about doing a second postdoc somewhere else after that. If they weren't ready to make a big change before then, that's totally fine. It's really up to you and your situation. I've worked with many people who are doing a second postdoc, and they and they decided that in that opportunity they wanted to um, put themselves in a different. Uh, environment for their second postdoc, but not so much in their first postdoc. So that's totally fine. But in case you were curious about opportunities to do a first postdoc or a second postdoc and come to work in a different research environment and come to New York City, I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about the institution where I work and New York City in general. And so I don't think I need to kind of explain much about why New York City could be a fascinating place to live in uh, with all of the amazing sights and sounds that we have and amazing buildings and art and all of the nature and all of the fantastic um, structures and the Statue of Liberty, um, all the sporting events that you can go to. I'm just highlighting all of these different things about why people might like to visit New York City and live here. But that's just to say that you need to have work-life balance in your career. And so that means that you want to choose a city to live in that can give you some fun things to do outside of the lab, right? So New York City is just one example of that. Certainly not the only city that has so many fun things to do. But just to keep that in mind, that when you move to a new place, check out that city that you're living in. Make sure there's enough fun things that you like to do that you can find to do in that particular city. Um, and so just to show you that all of our postdocs here in New York City and at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they all find fun things to do outside of the lab. We really strongly stress that work-life balance is super important. So maybe they'll go to a sporting event. Maybe they'll go kayaking in the river. Maybe they'll go and visit some of our amazing structures and buildings. Whatever you need to do to take a break from the lab, our postdocs make sure that they do it. Uh, and we make sure that our postdocs are having good work-life balance. So I would want the same for all of you. Find a city that has some fun things to do that you enjoy doing outside of the lab um, and then make friends with other postdocs and, and do all of those fun things together. It's important to take a break um, and then come back to the research and be more refreshed after that. And to tell you a little bit more about Memorial Sloan Kettering in particular, there are kind of two main um, arms to the institute where I work. There's a Sloan Kettering Institute, which has all of the basic biomedical research labs. And then there's also the Memorial Hospital, the Cancer Hospital, which also has additional labs as well. So this goes back to the point about, I want you to think about what type of research would you like to do? Would you like it to be more basic biomedical or translational or clinical? Um, what type of experience would you like to have? So our basic biomedical research, you know, we have all of the standard molecular, cellular, and developmental biology and genetics. We have all of those um, standard basic biomedical programs. And then we also have Memorial Hospital as well, that, that all of the uh, physician scientists who see patients and also have their own labs and do research as well, um, they work with students and postdocs who are more interested in clinical and translational research too. So that you could kind of decide on your own about which direction you'd like to go in for your postdoc, depending on the previous research experience you've had. And then think about which types of uh, working environments you'd like to be in. Would you like to be in a university that has a standard cellular and molecular biology departments? Or would you like to work at a medical center that has a hospital with physician scientists who see patients and who also have labs as well. And you'd like to do more clinical type of research. So that's a decision that you would make for yourself. Um, and then just kind of sharing more generally, if you were actually working in the field of cancer research or wanted to work in that field, and you want to work at a medical center or a research hospital in the United States, Memorial Sloan Kettering, where I work is just one of them. I'm listing here like the top cancer research hospitals in the US across the country. There are um, a lot of strong options to choose from and Memorial Sloan Kettering is usually maybe number two or three um, in that list every year. 
And something else to think about when you're thinking about which institution to work at, besides the type of research you would like to do, either it's more basic biomedical or it's more translational or clinical, you also want to think about this balance of research and teaching at the institution. Because ultimately, if you were going to pursue a faculty career, there needs to be some kind of balance of research and teaching. Those are two um, kind of goals that every faculty member has to achieve. Some institutions have a lot more research and much less teaching. Some institutions have a lot more teaching and a lot less research. So it's up to you to choose the institution that best fits what you would like to do. Would you like to do more teaching or would you like to mostly just be doing research? Or would you like kind of a balance of the two? Uh, or, or want to primarily do research and not as much teaching. So I'm just listing here some examples of institutions in the New York City area that either primarily do research and have very little teaching or have a lot more teaching and less research. And so you would basically choose whichever institution is the better fit for you, depending on the balance of research and teaching that you would like to have in your postdoc and then ultimately in your career moving forward after that. Okay, so I wanted to take a quick look at the chat uh, and it seems like Pawan is uh, answering all the questions there. So I, I appreciate that Pawan is doing that. And I'm gonna, gonna keep moving forward with the slides. Okay, so for your postdoc strategy, types of career options after your postdoc. Uh, I wanted to give you all a preview of this now because as I was mentioning before, oftentimes people are unaware of all of the options available to them after the PhD. So they, the natural step is to do the postdoc, and then they will use the postdoc as a time to then explore all of these options and figure out ultimately what would they like to do more long term in their career. So this is totally fine if you are in the position where you are doing a postdoc, then you think about um, exploring different careers outside of academia during your postdoc. I've worked with many people in this situation, but ultimately you just want to make sure that you join a lab that is supportive of all of these different careers that you might be interested in pursuing. How can you find out about that? Oftentimes in the interview process and also getting a sense of the other people who work in the lab and who have worked in the lab previously. What jobs have they gotten after they left that lab? Did they get all different types of jobs or did they only get one type of job? Because that's the only type of job that the PI could help them get. So you want definitely want to get a sense of that when you're looking at uh, labs to apply to. If you wanna be keeping your options open after the postdoc in terms of jobs that you'd like to explore, then hopefully the other people graduating from that lab were in, in a similar position as well. So you're not gonna be the first person uh, to kind of uh, present that to the PI who has never worked with somebody interested in leaving academia. You don't want to be the first person to do that in that lab. So you wanna make sure that other people have done it before you. Okay, so in that regard, some other aspects about how people who have been successful in their postdoc have been able to accomplish being successful. So again, it's not just about having a good publication record. You need to be thinking about a few other things about being successful in your postdoc. Have an understanding of the career goals that you would ultimately like to achieve after this training period is over. So if you do want to think about pursuing other jobs, maybe in industry, like I was saying before, you want to work in a lab that is supportive of exploring those other career options, and maybe even the mentor has some industry contacts, that would be fantastic. And if you do know that you want to become a faculty member, then you want to work in a lab that's supportive of you developing your own niche within the field and taking projects with you and starting your own lab and not being in competition with your current mentor. And so again, how are you going to get a sense of this? during the interview process, talking with people who were previously in that lab. If there were people who got a job as a faculty member after being a postdoc in that lab, you should ask them how these conversations went about developing their own niche and starting their own lab and not being in competition with the PI. Was that a difficult conversation or was that an easy conversation? And then you can think about, okay, if it was an easy conversation, then maybe this is a lab that I could think about joining because it will help me prepare to be a good faculty member going forward. Okay, so ultimately, uh, with whichever career path that you want to choose in academia or outside of academia, you want to make sure that your postdoc is giving you an opportunity to be developing important skills for any job within inside academia or outside academia. And this kind of goes back to some of the points I was um, mentioning before, that you want the um, to have opportunities your postdoc to be leading projects, mentoring junior researchers, working collaboratively, 
having lots of opportunities to present your research to different audiences and to be developing all of these skills um, so that if you didn't have a lot of time during your PhD or during your first postdoc to develop these skills, you're going to be developing these skills uh, during this new postdoc experience as well. And they will help you be successful in any job that you're going to go into. And so I want to give you all a preview of there are many career options available for PhDs and postdocs within academia and outside of academia. Uh, you may be interested in pursuing jobs in industry and biotech and pharma. You may be interested in things more related to entrepreneurship or working at a startup company, a small company. Maybe you want to go into the business of science, um, like work, maybe working in consulting. Maybe you want to do more teaching. Maybe you want to work in science policy and education. There are a lot of different options available to you. Uh, but what I want all of you to do right now is to just be aware that there are a lot of options after the postdoc is done that you could potentially um, move into for your career and start with conducting a self-assessment here, step number one. A fantastic online tool to conduct a self-assessment is called My Individual Development Plan or My IDP. This is an online survey that you can take uh, from Science Careers that, you know, the journal Science also publishes this website called Science Careers. So this is an online survey that you can take um, and you can basically find out a lot of information about yourself and about what you're interested in doing after the postdoc is done or after the PhD is done. And so the survey asks you to fill out information about your skills, interests, and values. And then it kind of gives you an output um, of all of the different careers that might be a good fit for you based on what your skills, interests, and values are in your research uh, career right now and moving forward. And so just to explain values a little bit more, um, oftentimes this is related to what's the future job that you would like to have in terms of location, salary, work-life balance, how much travel you'd like to have, if the job is going to be very intellectually challenging, if the job is going to have a lot of teamwork or a lot of independent work. So these are the values that you personally decide, this is what I would like to uh, experience in my career going forward. I want to have a certain type of work-life balance. I want to have a certain type of salary. I want to live in a certain place. I want this job to have little to no travel or a lot of travel, etc. So those are values that are important to you for your job going forward. And so you would fill out all of that information in the survey, and then it tells you kind of what careers would be a good fit for you uh, based on the information that you filled out. Uh, and so I just want to note that some examples of maybe why people prefer academia is because of the freedom to work on any interesting, interesting question that you can get funding for, that you can get a grant for. And so that's kind of um, addressed in the survey as well about that level of intellectual freedom. Whereas some people might prefer to work in industry because of the opportunity to develop drugs in a very fast paced environment and to really see these results being moved into the clinic extremely quickly uh, and to be a part of that process as well, that drug development process in this fast paced environment. So again, that's all about the, the um, work culture that you would enjoy and kind of the uh, where you find your passion, where you get your satisfaction out of your career by working in this fast paced environment, by seeing these types of results that may not be so evident in academia. So again, the, the survey helps to ask you all of these types of questions so you can get a sense of what type of job might be a better fit for you as well. Okay, so the, the survey will give you this output of all of these different career types, um, maybe working in the business of science, intellectual property, and patent, being a patent agent, maybe entrepreneurship, starting your own business, maybe working in science writing, science medical and science and medical communications, being a journal editor, uh, maybe more of a teaching career, maybe more of a scientist career, but in industry instead of in academia, et cetera. So this is just a preview. It gives you a lot of um, different career options to explore. And then afterwards, you can click on all of the links and it will tell you more about all of these different career paths that are available to somebody who has done a PhD or a postdoc. And to give you a preview of that, you will learn from using utilizing the resources on this website that there are, when we talk about industry jobs, there are many industry jobs available to you beyond just being a scientist. There are many industry jobs available. Um, you can work in research and development, um, but you can also you can also work in other areas as well. 
Uh, you can work in business development, you can work in regulatory, you can work in clinical research. Um, there are, you can also work in quality control or quality assurance. You can work on more of the commercial side of things like marketing and communications. And then you can work on more of the medical side of things such as being a medical writer, medical science liaison, or working in medical affairs. So there's actually a lot beyond just the realm of being a scientist in research and development that you can explore within the realm of working in industry. And just to share with all of you, a lot of our postdocs here at Memorial Sloan Kettering have gone into lots of careers, either in academia, in industry as a scientist, or in some other type of career within industry, or this third category of other types of careers. I'm going to share with you all the most common careers that our postdocs have been successfully able to pursue have been in the business side and working in either equity research, investment banking, or consulting. Um, in law, becoming a patent lawyer, uh, or working in nonprofit or working for the government, uh, sometimes in a research capacity as well. Working in more of a teaching career, teaching science instead of doing research, or working as a journal editor or in medical communications. All right, so um, those are the, the main kind of fields that people have gone into after the uh, postdoc in terms of our postdoc alumni. And I'm just taking a look at the chat here and there have been so many questions. I appreciate that Pawan has been answering all of them. And I love this question that he has posed to the audience about what careers were you already aware of beyond the postdoc? Maybe give us one example of that. Um, and so careers that you were already aware of, and then hopefully also from today, I've been sharing with all of you the, the knowledge that there are many different options available beyond working in academia or even just beyond working as a scientist in industry as well. And just to kind of bring it home with where our postdocs at Memorial Sloan Kettering have ended up after they finished their postdoc, uh, uh, about almost 30% did go into faculty positions. Another 30% actually did a second postdoc if this was their first postdoc. And about uh, almost another 30% uh, were working in scientist positions, mostly in industry, sometimes in a nonprofit or a government research setting. And then this last category of about 15% of people uh, were working in these other cat groups like working in business, consulting, maybe medical communications. Right, so those are all of the career paths um, available to you after you finish your PhD or postdoc. And I wanted to share some information with all of you um, about some examples from our postdoc alumni and the jobs that they have pursued after they finished their postdoc here at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And then also I wanted to mention um, this point about is a long postdoc necessary and to give you some examples of whether or not that was the case. Um, so here I'm giving you six examples of people who came from all over the world to do their postdoc here at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And then they ended up having a really exciting career path um, in academia or in other careers. And I'm just giving you six examples of people who um, stayed in the US after doing their postdoc here. But this is just to note that we have many alumni who either went back to their home country or ends up getting a job in another country. And basically we have alumni who have gotten jobs all over the world. Uh, but just for simplicity's sake, I want to give you six examples of people who came from all over the world and then they ended up getting a job um, staying in the US after they finished their postdoc here. So three examples, Hatis, Kamini, and Cornelius who are now also um, they all got jobs recently as well. This is another point that I wanted to mention. These are all recent postdoc alumni. They all got jobs in academia here in the United States. And of course, if you wanna be an assistant professor, yes, a postdoc is required. Uh, and then three other people, um, Janine, Manisha, and Nihar, who are in different types of jobs right now. So Manisha and Janine are both, sci are both scientists, either working at AstraZeneca or Regeneron, two pharma companies. Um, and so in Manisha's case, really only a short postdoc was required to get the senior scientist job at AstraZeneca. So I want you all to keep in mind that you don't have to, if you do a postdoc and you ultimately want to go into industry, you don't have to do a long postdoc um, because she was able to get a scientist job in industry after have only having done a one to two year postdoc. In Janine's case also, a short postdoc was required uh, for the job. So in order to get a higher level scientist position in industry, yes, a postdoc was actually required um, because they would be considering candidates with no postdoc experience 
for lower level scientist positions within that same company. So to get a higher level scientist position, a postdoc was required, but again, not a long postdoc, a short postdoc. And the, in Janine's case, he actually did a long postdoc. He did about a five to six year postdoc, but that's because he wanted to work in a few different research areas during his postdoc. So that's fine. He had reasons for doing that. He wanted to get more extra research experience, and then he decided to apply for industry positions. But that's just to say that you can do a short postdoc uh, and then think about what other options to pursue outside of academia. That's totally fine. And finally, in the last case, we talked about academia and industry. And then the other realm that people often move into is on the business side. So Nihar is now a consultant at a consulting firm, uh, an, a worldwide firm called IQVIA. And actually for these jobs, in fact, really no postdoc is required. But in Nihar's case, when he was getting his PhD, he really didn't know about um, career paths that he wanted to pursue. So he did the postdoc. And then during the postdoc, he realized that he wanted to become a consultant. And then he became a consultant afterwards, after doing a, um, a short postdoc of about two to three years long. Okay, so those are some examples that I wanted to share with all of you regarding different careers that anybody who does a postdoc can consider for themselves. And those were just six examples of people who got jobs here in the United States after having done a postdoc here at, at my institution at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And there were some questions that people had posted in that survey that you filled out when registering um, for today's webinar. Uh, regarding doing an industry postdoc. So I just want to take a moment to talk about what is an industry postdoc and why it might be useful to do one or maybe not. An industry postdoc is really best suited for people who either just finished their PhD or they have only done a short academic postdoc so far. It's not really appropriate for people who have done a long academic postdoc already. Um, the positives of doing an industry postdoc is that if you were only focused previously on doing basic biomedical research, this is a very good way for you to transition from academia to industry and to land your first industry job. Um, and some people enjoy being a postdoc in industry because they still have that postdoc feeling of working on independent projects, but they're still working within industry, so they're still learning about more long-term industry career options that they can pursue. Some of the negatives of doing an industry postdoc is that it's a lower salary than that of an industry scientist position. And then also ultimately you're, you know, you're still in this training period, you're delaying your career goals even further about ultimately becoming an industry scientist by, by doing another training period before becoming an industry uh, scientist afterwards. But my take home message is that depending on the company you may want to work for, if you see that um, they really prefer that their scientists have postdoc experience, or previous industry experience, and you have neither of those, then you could at least apply for an industry postdoc first and do that, and then get a scientist job afterwards. Um, so I hope that answers the, the questions that people had about the concept of doing an industry postdoc. And so now I want to shift gears for the next um, part of this talk today. And uh, now we're going to be talking more about kind of more specific advice on how to apply for a postdoc job and finding postdoc jobs, uh, finding job postings, and then we're gonna be talking about some advice for interviewing for a postdoc job as well. So we started a bit more broad about the concept of doing a postdoc, thinking about different career options that the postdoc might be useful for in terms of preparing you for that next step. And now we're gonna take a step back and talk a bit more about this um, kind of short-term practical advice about, okay, you want to apply for a postdoc job, how you're actually gonna do that and how you're going to interview as well. Uh, and Pawan's note there to keep posting your questions in the chat. Thank you again to Pawan for uh, keeping an eye on the chat throughout the talk. And so now talking about uh, applying for a postdoc position. The typical way you should approach this is to get help from your current advisor, your current mentor, and also any other faculty members who are also um, kind of mentors within your department as well, and ask them for advice about where it might be good for you to apply for a postdoc position. They have a big network, they know a lot of people, they are aware of other labs, they are aware of other universities. It's definitely best for you to start and get their advice first, and then, you know, you don't have to take their advice 100%, but at least to hear it first and then think about what you would like to pursue um, on your own afterwards. So ultimately, the, the what you need to do when applying for a postdoc position is be ready to send a lot of emails because the most common way that people get a postdoc position is by 
sending an email and asking if a postdoc position is available in this PI's lab. Um, so you have your list of faculty in whose labs maybe you'd be interested in working in, and you send each of them an email introducing yourself, explaining why you're interested in working in their lab, and then asking if there are any potential postdoc opportunities. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, there was a question in the chat about how can you find postdoc positions? Oftentimes they might be listed on the lab's website, but even if they're not, that could be because the lab's website is outdated. So, and maybe they just didn't bother to update the website with more job postings. So it's really, there's no harm in sending an email and just asking about if there are any postdoc positions available, because sometimes the website may not be uh, as up to date as you would have expected it to be. So you ask about those opportunities after introducing yourself and you attach your CV and a cover letter to explain more about your research interests and why you want to apply to this lab in particular. And so sometimes people have asked me when I've given this talk before, how many faculty members should I contact? How long should this list be? Well, it's really up to you and the amount of time that you can spare to be sending all these emails and hoping to hear back from people. But you do want to uh, have multiple interviews and maybe even have multiple offers to choose from. You don't wanna just be applying to one or two labs because uh, you really won't know if you're gonna hear back from either of those. I mean, I've worked with people who they probably easily have applied to maybe 20 to 30 labs on that order. They had the time to apply to that many and they were hoping to get multiple interviews out of that and maybe even more than one offer. And then th that way you can compare offers you can compare offers and really decide what is the best option for you instead of only having one interview and one offer that you can choose from. All right, so more advice here about how to make sure that your email is actually read by the person that you're sending it to. Uh, so it's best if you have any connection possible to the PI that you're emailing. I have worked with a lot of people who told me that they got in touch with this PI because they had previously met them at a conference. Now, a lot of conferences are still online right now. They've been online for the past two years during the pandemic. So hopefully that will make it easier for you to attend an international meeting because a lot of things are still online. You can attend an online conference and then there are a lot of faculty presenting there, or maybe even you have the chance to present your work in a talk or in a poster. Um, so an ideal situation is to say that you had met somewhere before, oftentimes at a research meeting or an online conference, somebody gave a talk, somebody was uh, impressed by the talk that you gave, or the faculty member gave a talk and you were impressed by the talk and you want to follow up with them after. Uh, and like I was saying before, besides you going out of your way to attend a conference, you also need to go out of your way to make sure that your faculty mentors are helping you. You send the emails, but they should send follow-up emails or even make a phone call if you're not hearing back um, from any PIs about potential postdoc opportunities. Even if they don't know that PI in whose lab you're applying to work in, it doesn't matter. They, as a faculty member, they kind of have more, um, they have more uh, basically potential to get a, oops, sorry, they have more potential to get a response. Apologies there. They have more potential to get a response um, sending a, an email as a faculty member instead of you as a PhD student or a postdoc. Uh, so if you're not hearing back, that's okay. Ask your faculty member to also help you with sending emails as well. Uh, even if they don't know that PI in whose lab you're applying to work in, it doesn't matter. Hopefully they will get some kind of response if you're not able to get one. And it's also fine to send a follow-up email. Um, maybe wait a week or two, one to two weeks, and then send a follow-up email after that uh, to see if the person is um, still willing to consider your application. If you don't hear back and you send a follow-up email and you still don't hear back, then I would say then it's time to move on after that, but it's never, it never hurts to send one follow-up email one to two weeks later. Um, so the some of the opportunities that you might hear about are that I'm actually not hiring right now, but maybe my colleague is hiring. Can I put you in touch with them? That's still a good position to end up being in at the end of the day. Um, or I'm not hiring right now, but let's stay in touch. And maybe a year from now, I will have a postdoc position open. Okay, if you're willing to wait a year, fine. You can follow up with them. If not, then you move on and you contact somebody else after that. Okay, so um, there are a couple of different ways that you might hear about these job opportunities. Like I said before, sometimes it will be on the lab website. 
Uh, and so this is just one example here uh, from our lab's websites. Each uh, lab at Morrill Sloan Kettering has its own lab website and it has its own section on career opportunities. And so this is an example of uh, one of our faculty members named Dr. Zhao, who had posted a um, a job description on her website to say that she is hiring. So you can utilize lab websites as a way to find job postings. Again, they won't always be listed here, but this is one option. And I wanted to show you some examples about different types of job postings that you might find for a postdoc. Sometimes they're structured a bit differently. So I want to give you three kind of main types of job postings that you should keep in mind you may be seeing. So in this case, I'm going to kind of increase the size of that area that I had boxed around. Um, and so basically there's one paragraph where Dr. Zhao talks about the main research areas in her lab. And she kind of lists four main research areas in her lab. So like I wrote down here, the job posting may be a bit general and it may just list some of these main research areas or potential projects that could be designed within each area. Um, so if it is pretty general, then in your cover letter, you're going to show interest in these main research areas, maybe picking one or two of them, and you can propose some projects to work on. Uh, because she hasn't been very specific, you want to show that you're taking initiative and you are interested in these main areas and you have some thoughts about potential projects that you can work on as well. All right, now, so that was an example of a job posting that was on a lab website. There are also, like I had mentioned before to answer somebody's question in the chat, there are also university jobs websites as well, where you, you go to the university and they have a careers page and you can search for all job postings there, all postdoc job postings there, regardless of which lab you're interested in. So we have that option at Memorial Sloan Ketter. You can search for all postdoc job postings, regardless of the lab um, on this one website here. And so let's say that you um, did that. And so the, basically I want to show you two more examples of postdoc job postings that you might see. If you just search on our website, on our careers page and you look for all postdoc job postings. So this is an example from our the Vandenbrink lab here at Sloan Kettering, and I'm going to increase the size of this area that I had boxed in here. And what I want you to notice is that in this postdoc job posting, they have been very specific about all the specific expertise that you need to have already had in your PhD, the specific projects that you're going to be working on in the postdoc. Um, and yeah, basically, these they outline in a very specific manner all of the techniques that you should be familiar with and what you're going to be working on, on for this particular postdoc project itself. Uh, and so why do they do that? It's most likely because the postdoc position that they have created has already been funded and, and there's a specific grant and there's specific language in terms of how this postdoc project was designed. And so they basically want you to come in and do the project because it was already funded and the project is already completely set up. So that's totally fine. That's not always a bad position to be in. This is actually quite common where the, the project has already been created. Um, and then you basically come in and you do the project as your first one. And then later on, you have the opportunity um, to then design independent projects after. So that this is a common situation to be in. And just make sure when you're interviewing that you do in fact find out that yes, you're gonna start on this project, but then you will also have opportunities to design projects later on as well. Okay, so then the, fir the third situation to be in. Um, just, uh... Oh yes, Colin? Yeah, we have uh, maybe seven, eight minutes left. So. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could we could we go for maybe another fifteen minutes? Is that possible? So we can end at. Uh, yeah, at 30? I mean it's up to, up to us. But uh, just for the people's time, if we could. Ah, you know, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So I think I will. I will try and go for about uh, fifteen more minutes. Uh, and then hopefully it seems like uh, there aren't as many questions now in the chat. Um, so hopefully you have already asked a lot of your questions as well. Okay, so the in terms of the postdoc job postings, um, this is a third example about what might come up, uh, where I'm going to increase the size of this area that I have boxed here. Um, they might say that, you know, just kind of generally we are interested in understanding um, these, these general concepts, we're interested in working in this field, 
read three of our recent papers to learn more. Okay, so that might be a common situation you find yourself in where they just say, read some of our recent papers. And then afterwards they ask the, um, they want you to be asking questions about what the lab is excited to work on now because this work was already published, right? But they want you to show interest in finding out more about what are the, some of the new things that the lab is working on now. So those are things that you should be addressing in your cover letter that you have read the recent papers, but you'd love to learn more during the interview about what the lab is currently working on. Um, and uh, because you'd be excited to, based on what they have already published, you'd be excited to hear more about what the next steps are. Okay, so those are kind of three uh, main section, main types of job postings that you would typically find. Uh, and then now I'm going to move on and talk about taking that job posting and applying and being a strong candidate. So going back to this job posting from Dr. Zhao, um, so you can see that in one aspect of her job posting, she has listed um, kind of a few things that you need to make sure you include in the job posting. And I have put that in a box here that I'd like to expand. What she has listed in the job posting uh, is that you have to include a cover letter describing your current and future research interests, a CV, a list of your expected availability date, and then a list of references. Okay, so that's very common for any postdoc position that you have to include these four main elements uh, in your application. It's going to be very standard. So I want to talk about these four elements as well. Expected availability date. So that's one of the things that she asks for. When is the right time to look for a postdoc? Um, so if you are currently a PhD student, it's very typical that you're going to be applying about six months bef uh, before you're ready to move on to the postdoc, uh, because you kind of know ahead of time that you're going to be defending your thesis, you're going to be graduating in this time frame, you have a sense of that easily six months beforehand. So that's when you should be starting to apply for postdocs. If you're looking to do a second postdoc, uh, then basically you decide when you want to make a change and apply for a different position, and you're going to basically be ready to apply to jobs so that you can leave your current job within one to three months time. Um, I think that's an appropriate time frame that you're giving the current job notice, one to three months notice that you're going to be leaving. Uh, and then essentially you're going to be applying for postdoc jobs and saying, I can start very soon. And then you figure out with your current boss, can I actually leave within one to three months? I'm going to start this new position. Uh, so that's the time frame that I think would be appropriate if you're either finishing up your PhD or you're already in a postdoc right now. The next is that you would have to include a cover letter. And I'm going to um, give some more examples of this in a couple slides. But essentially, the cover letter should talk about why you're interested in this research um, project or projects that you'd like to accomplish in this lab and what you're hoping to learn and what you're hoping to contribute based on your expertise. You have to both learn things from the lab and be able to contribute something that you're whatever you're bringing into the lab as well, uh, based on maybe what you did in your PhD or your first postdoc. The third thing that you need to include is a list of three references. So typically you're going to be asking for recommendation letters from your current mentor. If you're a PhD student, then it would be your current PhD mentor, thesis advisor, maybe people on your thesis committee. Uh, and if you have started a postdoc, but you're a more junior postdoc, you can ask those same people. Uh, and basically you can ask current and former mentors uh, in, within academia to provide recommendation letters. And finally, the CV. So I definitely get a lot of questions about what should the CV include. You have to show some evidence of publications, presentations, and maybe, maybe not some honors or awards that you've gotten before. In terms of publications, if you're applying to do um, a postdoc and you're coming from a PhD, yes, in that case, then you may not have had a lot of opportunity to publish. Uh, but think about utilizing preprint servers. A very common one here in the United States is called BioArchive. So a lot of our faculty, they are happy to see applications where maybe the person has not been able to publish a lot in their PhD, but they were able to put their manuscript on a preprint server, such as BioArchive. If you are already doing a postdoc, then you should definitely have examples of first author publications if you've already finished a PhD and are doing a postdoc right now. Um, so this is kind of like the, the baseline here where the faculty will be expecting to see um, either a first author manuscript on a preprint server or a publication if you're already in the middle of doing a postdoc right now.
And then sometimes if you have given a, a presentation, the conference meeting abstracts are also published as well. So that could be a publication too. Uh, and don't forget about co-author publications. Those are very important in addition to any first author work um, that you can show as well. And then for presentations, any examples of international meetings that you have attended would be fantastic to show. Um, you, if you are currently doing a postdoc, you need to be showing how you have been doing more than that, accomplishing some in the PhD, but we're doing more things in the postdoc, maybe more publications, more presentations. And so that's how you've been continuing to be productive in academia. And then the honors and awards and fellowships, not 100% uh, required, but certainly would never hurt. It would never hurt if you were able to show that you've gotten a fellowship or a grant before. I would say probably publications are the most important in terms of what's going to be on the CV. And so here's the suggestions that I would like to provide with all of you in terms of what you should be including in your cover letter. You basically need to have three main sections of the salutations, uh, the first paragraph, the middle paragraphs, and then the closing with it being maybe about one page long or one and a half pages long total. You basically want to open the cover letter by saying um, who you are and why you're interested in applying for this position. So here I'm including some suggestions here about I'm currently a postdoc uh, in this lab. My research expertise is on X, Y, and Z. I would look forward to the possibility of uh, moving into this new research field and working with you um, on these new projects. And so basically what you have done so far and why you're interested in applying to this new lab in particular. And here are some suggestions about what you can say for people who have taken time off and then they want to go back into academia. So examples like I worked in industry for a few years, but now I'm excited to return to academia and pursue a postdoc position because this closely aligns with my research and career goals, okay? Uh, and so after that, then you can talk about some more detail about um, the expertise that you have in terms of what you've worked on in your uh, previous research, and then turn it towards why you're hoping to learn new things in this new lab and propose some projects to work on. Uh, and what you can bring with you to contribute to the lab, some expertise that they don't currently have. So again, it's a mutual relationship. You want to learn new things from this lab, but also based on what you've worked on before, you're hoping to bring new expertise to the lab as well that they don't currently have. And all of this is going to help you with achieving your long-term research goals in the end. Uh, you either want to move into this new field as a faculty member, or maybe end up doing interdisciplinary work of both your PhD and your postdoc. And then finally, you just thank them for consideration, give the names of the three people who are going to be writing you reference letters. Okay, so again, it's about one page, one and a half pages long. That's the cover letter. The reference letters, uh, those three people who are going to be writing you reference letters, they are going to essentially be writing you a letter because they have already written you a letter before for something else. And so they're happy to do it again. Uh, and you also want to um, have a good sense of what they would be writing and maybe speak with them beforehand before they submit the letter. These are some suggestions here about what they should be writing about. They explain how they've known you and in what capacity and for how long. And they think that they have a, you have accomplished a lot so far in your research career. And they think that you have a bright future ahead of you and you would be a good fit for joining this new lab and would be a good lab member um, in this new environment and you would can be contribute a lot and would be a good colleague. So they need to have a sense of what you have accomplished so far and why you want to join this new lab and why you think you would be um, a good addition to that lab. And then they should speak to all of that as well in their reference letter. I had mentioned before, you also need to send your CV. My advice here is that you should ask other colleagues in academia for examples of how they have formatted their CV. So you can think about how you're going to format yours, but ultimately a typical academic CV includes all of these sections. Um, it has your education, research experience, publications, any patents, any awards, all the presentations you've given, any teaching or mentoring experience, any leadership or service um, within your institution or within your field, oftentimes serving as a peer reviewer of a journal, a list of societies that you have been a part of, and a list of references at the end. This is a typical academic CV. And a note here on the bottom about when you're applying for jobs in the US, you don't need to include um, some of this information on your CV when you're applying for jobs in the US. Um, so for the purposes of saving time, I'm going to um, kind of 
go through the Q and A. We're not going to have time to ask those questions. Um, so I hope still maybe about five more minutes for me to wrap up the the final slides here uh, because I do want to talk about some advice on interviewing for a postdoc position. So now we've talked about applying, and now let's talk about interviewing for a postdoc position in the in the last five or so minutes of this webinar today. Um, so what's typically going to be expected is you present. Uh, a research seminar, it's usually either your PhD thesis seminar or a seminar on postdoc project that you've worked on, a completed postdoc project, if you are currently doing a postdoc uh, right now or you have done one before. And then after that, you're going to have a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of the people in the lab. And you can also um, speak with lab alumni as well, former people in the lab who were previously in the lab and have now moved on to other things. There's no harm in also talking to both current and former lab members. Uh, and so what I would like to note here is that for all of you who are international and it may be hard for you to travel for these interviews, that's okay because most likely the interview process is gonna be entirely virtual. But at the same time, if there is a PI, who would prefer to meet you in person, I think that is always a good sign. Um, that shows that they're very interested in you and they really are going out of their way to help schedule travel accommodation so that you can come and do this interview in person. I think that's always a better position to be in. If you're working with a PI who wants to interview you in person, that's always a good sign. Uh, and so the questions that you need to be asking, whether it's virtual or in person, are in kind of in three main areas. You want to learn more about the research potential um, for the projects that are being proposed for you to work on, both short and long term, in terms of like the first project and all of the long term postdocs, um, long term postdoc projects that you could be working on. You want to get a sense of what the PI's mentoring style is and if that's a good fit for you. And then you want to talk to each lab member and understand if they have a willingness to uh, work with others and collaborate and teach people other things and what their expertise is uh, and essentially how collaborative they could be with you, what you could learn from them and what you could teach them in that regard. And if you're getting a good sense of this collaborative spirit from each of the lab members, in addition to the PI being a good mentor, th these are all good signs that this could be a good lab to work in. I suggest that you ask to meet with each lab member separately because sometimes they may not be as honest if they're all in a big group. Um, but if you can meet with the PI separately and then each lab member separately, that would be a good interview experience um, for you to have. And, and so in terms of the questions that you should be asking, um, how long is the postdoc going to be funded is a big one because you wanna make sure that the funding is uh, basically already set in stone and you don't have to worry about the postdoc position not being funded after a year or two. So these are definitely questions that you should ask the PI that your the postdoc that you're applying to is going to be well-funded and will not only last for one or two years. It certainly never hurts to apply for fellowships to get more funding, but that shouldn't be a requirement for you to do. And then ultimately, like I was saying before, you wanna to talk to both the current and former members of the lab, ask them about how this PI is as a mentor, if they felt supported when they were thinking about different career options to explore. Uh, and then you can also talk to people in neighboring labs too. If you happen to go in person, talk to people in neighboring labs on the same floor because they might have um, gotten to know the PI and the people in the lab as well. And then you can get more opinions there. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna skip the Q&A uh, because we're already running out of time here. But one thing I did want to mention is when you're moving into a very new field uh, for your postdoc, there are some aspects that you want to keep in mind uh, when you're going on the interview. You definitely want to make sure that you are basically putting out there in your talk this is my expertise, and then this is what I would like to learn, but there is a knowledge gap here. I'm very excited to move into this new field, but I'm hoping that I can receive training in the lab in order to become an expert because I'm not currently, but I'm a fast learner, and I, um, I hope that I will be getting the expertise necessary to get up to speed within the lab. And then basically see how people react to that afterwards. See how the PI reacts to that. See how the lab members react to that. If this is a lab where they're willing to teach other people, that's a good sign. If this is a lab where they're not really so excited that somebody is coming in with a huge knowledge gap and is lacking a lot of expertise, that's not a good sign. That means that's going to be very hard for you to get up to speed in this new lab. Yes, you do want to 
try new things, you do want to gain new expertise, but you also need to make sure you're finding a lab that's going to be willing to teach you as well. So you need to get a good sense of that uh, during the interview process. All right, so I'm going to very quickly go through the rest of these slides here. Um, as we're, as we're wrapping up the webinar in the last few minutes. And some kind of final points I wanted to note are that in addition to interviewing, making sure the lab is a good home for you, you also need to be aware of the other resources that are available at that institution or that university where you're gonna be a postdoc because there are some important resources available to postdocs hosted by that university or institution where the lab is based that I want all of you to be aware of. And so I'm just giving you some quick examples um, from what's happening uh, on our website here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, on our website and where we list all of the um, benefits that we provide to all of the postdocs. And so what I want you, all of you to take home is that whatever institution you apply to, to do a postdoc, you wanna make sure that they provide these same types of benefits and resources for all postdocs. And if not, then you should be considering other institutions. I'm showing you some examples here about benefits that we provide to all of our postdocs here at Sloan Kettering. And so you wanna make sure that you are finding those same benefits at whatever institution um, you go to, okay? And so, yeah, like I, I see a note in the chat, I will wrap up in just another few minutes. Uh, I just wanted to kind of close out with some final points here. Thank you all for sticking around for another couple of minutes. Uh, and so one of these main benefits that I would like to make sure you're all aware of are housing and compensation, okay? So and let's talk a little bit about compensation here. Um, what you should find on the postdoc office's website at that university where you are applying to do a postdoc is some information about salary. Okay, so typically um, the postdoc period will be funded for around five to six years. And then after that is kind of up to the PI and it's up to the institution about if they would still classify you as a postdoc or if they would classify you as something different, um, something beyond a postdoc, like maybe a senior research scientist. So you should find information on the website uh, about what the salaries are for somebody in the first two to three years of the postdoc and then after five to six years. All of this should be very easy for you to find on the postdoc office's website. And you should see that there is a promotion and there is a salary increase over time. That's something that you should absolutely confirm. And talk to the postdoc office about if you have any questions uh, about how they are determining what your salary is. And you can also negotiate um, this minimum salary that's listed on the website with your PI and see if they would be willing to give you something higher than the minimum. It is, these are all posted here as the minimum salaries, not the maximum salaries. So that's something that you can discuss with your PI. And you can also negotiate the start date as well. Um, the postdoc office will tell you more about benefits uh, like housing and childcare and healthcare, and the immigration office will tell you more about your visa application. All of those things will be listed in your office on your offer letter, but sometimes you need to go to a few different offices to get the information that's needed. Okay, so essentially the benefits that you must have are access to housing, um, medical benefits, health care, there should be child care options available, and also vacation and sick time, parental leave, and resources for mental health. So you want to make sure that the postdoc office has all of those resources available to you, and also that they have an immigration office that can educate you about either the J-1 or H-1B visa that you would be applying for in order to come to the U.S. to do a postdoc. Those are the two typical types of visas um, that our postdocs have when they're coming from outside the U.S. to do a postdoc here. So you would need to make sure that you know exactly who to contact at the immigration office at that institution to get support in applying for the visa application. All right, so some final take home points here are that what I'm listing on this slide are a number of different groups and organizations and career exploration clubs, if you will, um, here in New York City, where I have found that a lot of our postdocs got, get involved because they see a lot of the PhD students getting involved in these organizations and they realize I should still be doing this as a postdoc too. So that's something I want all of you to consider is that you are, will be spending a lot of time in the lab 
but you also want to be doing things and getting involved in clubs and organizations outside of the lab as well. A lot of PhD students do this. Sometimes it's you know kind of part of their curriculum, but postdocs should be doing this as well. They should be involved in some of these career exploration clubs. The university has teaching and career centers. They should be utilizing all of those resources that the PhD students are utilizing. The postdocs should be getting all of this exposure outside of the lab to all of these um, career opportunities related to different clubs and organizations that are focused on exploring any one different type of career of interest, okay? Um, and so also consider things to do outside of the lab to make sure that you're successful in your postdoc and you're enjoying the experience. Join diaspora groups, like become a part of iSTEM care. We have different groups in New York City for international researchers. I'm just listing here all of their logos. Joining these groups and getting support for them will really um, help make a difference in how you're going to be developing skills over time in your postdoc and getting the support that you need. Okay, and so some kind of final take home points here about getting that support that you need from those resources outside of the lab that I mentioned. You also need to get support from your mentor, your current postdoc mentor, and from other um, resources within the institution as well. Okay, so remember that um, during your time period of being a postdoc, it could be short, it could be a couple of years, or it could be five to six years. That's kind of up to you and your decision-making process of what do I want to go into academia or do I want to go into industry? And if I want to go into industry, I only really need to do a short postdoc, okay? So that's something to keep in mind that you're thinking about the um, having a successful training period, either a couple of years long or longer than that, if you ultimately want to go into academia. And so you're gonna have discussions with your mentor during all of these kind of annual meetings that the postdoc office will require you to have with your mentor to make sure that you're meeting those goals after two to three years or after five to six years. And I want all of you to take ownership of this process and ask your postdoc office for help if and when you need help with having conversations with your PI. I'm showing you an example here of the annual mentoring form that you and your PI would have to fill out and send to our postdoc office if you were a postdoc here. And so some of the main questions that we require you to discuss, oh, sorry, I had, um, this is not showing up here, but some of the main questions that we would require you to discuss are basically discuss with your mentor um, about the feedback that you would like from them in order to improve the next year we are working on from one year to the next, how you can improve the next year around. And if you feel like you're not having a good mentor-mentee relationship, you need to be comfortable discussing that with them and telling them uh, what mentoring style is gonna, really gonna work well for you in order to be able to accomplish everything that you would like to accomplish in the lab within the next year. So you have to be willing to have open and honest conversations with your PI about within the next year, what are the goals that I would like to uh, accomplish? And then ultimately, um, what feedback can I get from you in order to make sure that I'm making progress over time? Okay, and so one other thing to consider is that there are some career development awards that you can apply for. Uh, and so your mentor could be happy that you're taking the time to think about some career development opportunities to be pursuing during your postdoc. And so even if you don't end up applying for all of them, at least take some time to research these career development awards and opportunities that are available. Your mentor will appreciate that you're being proactive about finding ways to better educate and better train yourself um, and to be more successful during the postdoc. And so one example here is, I want you all to become familiar with the NIH. Uh, within the United States, that's our main um, kind of government sponsored funding center uh, where all of the government sponsored research um, is coming from the NIH. And so they have a lot of career development awards for postdocs. And so I want you to become familiar with looking for opportunities to apply for, even if you don't end up applying for them, see what kinds of options are available. And so when you're completing your postdoc, Think about the advice that these awards give in terms of how you can actually be developing your career over time. And so, so these awards are kind of similar to a starting grant. You may have heard the term starting grant before, so it's a very similar concept. Uh, but essentially there's two take home messages here in terms of what these awards um, 
provide for postdocs who want to be working on developing their career. They give you um, training on basically finding lots of opportunities to take more courses to develop your scientific skills. And so that's something you can ask your PI about. Can I take some more scientific or research-based courses through my institution or through a society? I'd like to get more training in this topic. Uh, can you support me in that regard? Because this is how I want to be furthering my career development by getting some more training. I found some courses that I would like to take. And then the second thing that these awards help you apply for, which you can discuss with your mentor, is to um, create a mentoring committee. If your research is moving in a new and exciting and different direction outside of the expertise of your mentor, then you should be having a co-mentor as well. It's always better to have a mentoring committee, a mentoring network. Um, so especially if your project is moving into a new direction, you'd like to have maybe one or two or three additional co-mentors or collaborators or sponsors or consultants. Um, these career development awards require you to have that. I think that's something useful for you to discuss with your mentor as well about having a mentoring committee. I'm going to, again, skip through the Q&A because uh, we didn't have time for that. And I realize we're about 10 minutes over. I apologize. I wanted to just leave everybody with this final slide here. This is the final slide where I'm going back to those six postdoc alumni I had introduced to you earlier. And I wanted to share with you all about one thing each of them did to help themselves be successful during their postdoc. All right. And these are all things I want you all to consider. What can you do during your postdoc to um, take some, some steps to be more successful? The people who stayed in academia, they applied for these NIH grants that I had mentioned. Um, and they also put themselves out there and did a lot of networking and gave a lot of guest seminars at different institutions across the country to kind of get their names out there and collaborate and network with people at institutions across the country. So that's something you should be doing about furthering your, developing your CV, applying for awards and doing more networking at institutions. In terms of leaving academia and pursuing other types of careers, what did these successful postdocs do? Again, they developed a network but of career mentors, not necessarily research mentors. They developed a network of career mentors to help them land a job in industry, people who are currently in industry. They developed a network of those people that they knew so they could reach out to them for help with applying for jobs. And they also developed a lot of leadership skills, either inside the lab or outside the lab. They made sure that if they wanted to be a scientist in industry or to be a consultant at a consulting firm, they could have lots of examples of how they were a leader, some type of leader, either in the lab or in some type of club or organization that they were a part of. So again, work on those leadership skills, mentoring skills, communication skills, uh, project leadership and people um, leadership are both essential for any type of career that you're going to move into. And with that, I'd like to apologize for going over time, but I appreciate everybody for sticking around. I'm going to send Pao on these materials that he can share with all of you, the slides um, and more information. And just to say thank you to everybody and please stay in touch on LinkedIn. And also here is my email address as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Taliana, for a wonderful presentation. I know it's hard to discuss everything within a short time, mm -hmm. but I think you did you know, awesome job and I hope people will get benefited. Um, I also thank you, the participants. So there are, you, if you get two more minutes, um, I had a one, can you, uh, I have stop one sharing. thing to do. Yeah, stop Absolutely. sharing. And uh, if people are comfortable, you can open your cameras. We'll take a snap for social media. Um, it will go on social media posting and if you want to join ISTEM care, work with us doing similar sessions, putting a link, I'll send you over, um, putting the link into chat, I'll also send you over the email. So maybe in 10 seconds, you can switch on your camera if you're comfortable, I'll take a snap. Um, and look for the feedback form, uh, which we will send you today or tomorrow with the slide and resources there. So I think uh, I'm gonna say one, two, three, so that you can have your favorite reaction. <laughs> uh, and I'll take a snap, all right. Uh, okay. All right, just a minute, huh? Mm. Okay. One, ready, right? One, two, three. Yeah, I'll take one more in case, you know, triplicates are better. We are aware of it. <laughs> okay. 
so with that let's end here and you know uh, this had been wonderful session also if you want to you know uh, the, this all this free session but the, what we wanted is encouragement for Thaliana and me and ISTM care so feel free to tag us over social media or LinkedIn write a review over LinkedIn a few lines that would be a great encouragement for for all of us and ISTM care so thank you so much have a good day good night I know uh, people from different regions of the world so <laughs> take care well and stay connected if you need any help with postdoc or exploration with Thaliana or me need any revise write it to us over email uh, the email you're getting uh, you know the same email id you can write to, right so thank you so much bye bye thank you goodbye everyone thank you Thaliana, you can stay for two minutes and we'll just um, yes yeah yeah i guess if, yeah i can stick around if everybody leaves yeah yeah thank you again for everybody for joining and thank you pawan for hosting me no it's it's my privilege it was awesome session